everybody. Good morning. Uh, okay, if everybody can sit up properly, yeah. If everybody can go off your phones, yeah. I used to spend my Sundays up there, so I know what you do during sermons when I look down. Okay, uh, if I end up scolding people accidentally, it's because I do it every day, so please forgive me. Okay, let's just see who is here today. Um, if you are here with me on this side, can you just wave to me? Yay, okay, your wave so sad. Can you put your hands higher and wave to me? All right, okay, you're here with me on this side. Can you wave your hands? Okay, nice. Um, I think when we watched the video, I'm not sure how many of you were at the conference. How many of you made it for like all the sessions of the conference? Anybody? Okay, a handful. The night sessions. How many of you attended the night sessions? Okay. I think if, we, if you were in the conference, you will realize what an exciting time it is to be alive. You know, uh, the first time I felt that was after the general elections, when we stayed up until 5 a.m. And then I needed to go to work the next day for something. But I woke up after two hours of sleep and I felt to myself, what a great time to be alive. And it was, as I was driving in the empty streets when everybody was sleeping, even though I had to go to work on that day, you know, I noticed, wow, the sky suddenly so beautiful. You know, wow, the, the birds flying suddenly look like they know how to fly very well. You know, and that was the first time I felt, you know, what an exciting time to be alive. And the other time that I really felt what an exciting time to be alive was uh, in our FGA, our recent FGA conference. You know, when the word, every time we gather together as FGA and the word that is given to us as a church, that is one of the most exciting things. Um, I'm not sure if you realize, but we always talk about it. But if you track back to all the things that God speaks to us, right? It's as though His word for us is becoming clearer and clearer. You know, if you go back to the 36th anniversary, you go back to the conference last year, and then you come to the conference this year, the things God is saying to us is really becoming clearer and clearer. It's clearer and clearer what He wants us to do. It's clearer and clearer how He wants us to do it. And if we do not catch it, it's very, it's very easy to miss out. It's very easy to miss out on what God is doing. And it is our choice to catch it. Um, one of the most encouraging things for me is that when God speaks, right, as He speaks more and more in all the different conferences, all the different events, it's something or a vi the vision that He gives us is not something that um, we are expected to do on our own, not as YM, not as CYC, not as the Malay service, not as the Tamil service, but it's something that we can only achieve together. And if you notice, and if you have been discerning the move of the Spirit, you find that God is bringing us together more and more. And I hope that every one of us would catch that. Um, for today, what I want to share about is that SYM, being a part of FGA, Okay, it is very important for each one of us to catch on to the vision of FGA. Can you turn to the person next to you and say, you must catch on to the vision God has for us. Alright. Okay, we need to catch on to the vision that God has for us. And it is time for us to stop taking all these things so lightly. I really think it is time for us as young people you are not too young, neither are you too old, to catch on to the things that God has for you. It's time to stop playing church. It's time to stop taking God lightly. It's time to stop, you know, wasting our life. And I really believe for each and every one of us, myself included, it is really time for us to take God seriously, listen to what He is saying. And if it's something we need to act upon and change in our life, then let's do that. Let's take that action. What I want to talk about today, following up from the conference, is catching the momentum of the Spirit. And then I'm going to take a reference from Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 to 26. If you can all turn to that, it will be also on the screen, but if you want to turn to that as well. No, we're not turning to that. Okay, everybody is just looking at the screen. Great. Okay, let's read Galatians 5, verse 13 to 26. Okay, let's read it together. One, two, three. 
You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. Okay, say to the, another person on your left or right, love your neighbour as yourself. Okay, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Verse 16. And so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Verse 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impure, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. If you are taking notes, which you should be, Everybody show me that you're taking notes. <laughs> no? How are you going to remember if you don't take notes? Okay, only like five people. So five people will remember the message for today. Okay, the, my first point for today is catching the momentum of the Spirit is to rely on and walk by the Spirit. And I really think the word for us today is to catch the momentum of the Spirit. The momentum being the movement of the Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit doing in our midst? What is He speaking to us? You know, if we live life every day, right, and you don't catch the momentum of the Holy Spirit, then I'm not sure what your purpose is for your life. I'm not sure you know what you are actually living for. But before we go into actually catching the momentum of the Holy Spirit, I think it's very important for us to recognize that Catching the momentum of the Spirit is a result of us walking by the Holy Spirit every single day. And the only way we can walk by the Holy Spirit every single day is if we understand why we are saved. If you look at the passage in verse 13, it says we are called to be free. Okay, everybody says, I am free. Everybody say, I am called to be free. Okay, don't just say, uh, make sure you actually understand what it is. Okay, I'm called to be free. And if you understand the context of what it means when you are called to be free, is that when you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you are free. Okay, I believe all of us here have received Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior at one point in our life or another. And that means you are free. But what are you free for? What are you free to do? Okay, you know, Sometimes, we take freedom to another level, okay? A lot of times when I talk to the students in my school, okay, I have a lot of students here, not sure if they're paying attention. Okay, a lot of times when I talk to the students in my school and I ask them, why do you do these kind of things, you know? Why do you go and um, get into this trouble, get into that trouble, do this, do that? And then they give me answers like, it's okay lah, teacher, God will forgive me. God very forgiving one. You know, or it's okay lah, teacher, I'm only 16 years old. I got a long way more in my life. You know, and, and the thing that makes me the most angry is when they do something wrong and then they come up to me and tell me, chill, teacher, chill. I say, you chill me one more time. Okay, it makes me so angry. But if you think about it, what are you using your freedom for? You know, we are set free. When we become believers, we are set free. But what are you using your freedom for? How do we know how we should live? Okay? And I think the key we find in the passage is that we need to actively walk by the Holy Spirit. We need to choose to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. And what does that look like? Okay, what does that look like? There was one day when I went, entered my class, 
okay, after break time. So I entered my class, and then straight away, all my students, some of my students ran to me and said, Teacher, do you see this boy? He was holding two Bibles. He's so holy, oh. And then I, uh, I said, since when, uh, people, holy people hold two Bibles? How does that make you holy? Uh, and we may laugh at that, but I think a lot of us don't realize that a lot of times when we say we walk by the Holy Spirit, that is sectioned out to the spiritual parts of our life. You know, in, in school, I always hear my students say this, devotions time must be holy, chapel time must be holy, hold the Bible then must be holy. Then I say, then what about rest of the time? No need to be holy. Ah. You know, and it's the same for us. If we reflect back on our life and we think about it, what are we doing out of our spiritual, out of our, the spiritual parts of our life? Okay, let's name a few spiritual parts of our life. Coming to church, maybe. It's counted as one of the spiritual parts of our life. Uh, maybe we attend prayer meeting. Maybe we do our devotions. So all those are the spiritual parts of our life, correct? But apart from that, how are we living dependent on the Holy Spirit? You know, a lot of us, um, we depend a lot on our emotions. We depend a lot on how we feel. A lot of us, we come to church, we expect a good worship session, all right? And then after that, I can see, you know, a lot of us very into worship. But the moment we go after that into the sermon time, a lot of times, most of the people who are very passionate in worship are on their phones. I don't understand that. You know, depend, being dependent on the Holy Spirit is something that should affect every part of our life. And in order to have to be dependent on the Holy Spirit in every part of our life, I think one thing that we need is an ongoing relationship with God, an ongoing relationship with the Holy Spirit. And what does that look like? Okay, it looks like this. I'm very, very close to my mom. Very, very close. Okay, she quit her job when I was born and then she's taken care of me ever since. Uh, yeah, ever since, however old I am. Okay, and... We even work in the same place. She works in the primary school. I work in the secondary school. So we literally travel to work together. We travel back home together. Okay? And then at home, whatever things that need to be done, uh, because it was my mom and me would go home earlier, so we would do everything. So I'm very, very, very close to my mom. And so close, right, that if she were to go out and come back home, right, and I hear footsteps, I would know it's her footsteps. Okay, so close to the point, right, in school, when, let's say, because we teach in different schools. I'm in the secondary, she's in the primary. And she's very fierce, fiercer than me. Okay, and sometimes I hear somebody scolding kids, you know. And the moment I hear the tone of the voice, right, I already know it's my mother. Okay, I'm so close with my mom to the point that... Um, Sometimes when I observe her in a conversation with somebody, before she even answers the word, I already know what she's going to say. I already know her response. And my question to us is this. Do we know the Holy Spirit like that? Do we understand the way He works so well that before He even finishes His sentence with us, before He even finishes uh, some, His conversation with us, that we already know what He's going to say? that we understand the tone of his voice. You know, we understand how his voice is like. If we hear his footsteps, that we immediately know, that's God. How are we with the Holy Spirit? Do we have that kind of relationship with the Holy Spirit? We need to actively depend on the Holy Spirit in all areas of our lives. Two years ago, um, I think two years ago, there was an unbound camp uh, at the end of the school holidays. And the next day, we needed to go back to school. And I was very busy during that school holiday, so I didn't have time to prepare for my lesson that when I needed to go back to school. But I told God, okay, never mind. I'm going to go for the camp. I'm going to do what I need to do, okay? And I'm going to trust that somehow you will produce a lesson from me from somewhere, okay? So I told God that. So at the end of the camp, I came, that, I came back, and after every unbound camp, as you would know, you are half dead. You're not even alive anymore. Okay, you sleep and you just want to sleep for 24 hours. But I needed to wake up the next day to go to school. So in the dark of my room when I opened my eyes, okay, and then my body is not even responding uh, to me to wake up, okay, I'm so tempted to just say I cannot make it for work, I'm, I'm not well, to take an MC. But then 
at that point when I decided to do that, right, I suddenly saw a blurred out version of my geography workbook. Okay? It was like a vision, half a sleep vision. So I don't know whether it's vision or whether I'm dreaming or whether I'm thinking things. Okay, now all my students know my secret, how I plan my lesson. Okay, but it's okay. Okay, so I suddenly saw a picture, you know, of my like geography workbook. And it even flipped the page, but everything was a bit blur, lah, okay? And then I felt the Holy Spirit say, ah, you just go and pick up that bowl, you open to that certain chapter, you will find what you need for the rest of the day. So I said, ah, okay, lah. okay, I go. So I dragged myself, I landed in school somehow, I picked up that geography textbook and I opened the book and sure enough, it was everything that I needed for the day. So how are you living by the Holy Spirit? Um... There was another time, again in school. So, in school, for me personally, I don't know if it's a standing joke for everybody who, who is in school, but there is never such thing as a good time to teach. Okay? In the morning, the students are sleepy. After break, the students are restless. Before lunch, they are hungry. After lunch, they are sleepy and restless. Before going home, all they want to do is go home. So if you tell me that there is a time, actually a good time to teach, right? There's no such thing, it's a lie, okay? So I had to take a class after lunch, okay? With a very, very restless class. And I really dreaded going into that time because after lunch, they are sweaty, they are smelly, and then they don't want to listen to you. And yeah, it's just not nice, okay? So I told God, okay, God, I need to go into this class and I really don't know what to do with this class. Every single thing I have tried to do with this class doesn't seem to work. Okay, they still don't listen to me, they still talk, they still walk around, they still play, nothing works. So I said, I asked God, what can I do? So as I was waiting, as I prayed, I felt the solution was to give them worksheets. Now, worksheets never work. I've tried it multiple times. It never works. Okay, they return back to you the empty worksheet with their name on it. That's about it. Okay, so, but I felt that, okay, God said, give them the worksheet. Okay lah, fine, I got no other solution. So I gave them the worksheet. I, I printed it, I went to class, you know, the smelly jumping boys all around, their uniform don't look like what already, okay, because they were playing the whole lunchtime. So I settled them down and then I gave out the worksheet. And true enough, you know, for the first time, they were all sitting down doing their work. I still don't know why. You know, I look at them, uh, okay, it works, you know, and, and I found like, wow, you know, God, you can even move in work. If we come back to ministry, okay, something that um, I really, I think in everything that we do, we always need to rely on the Holy Spirit. And for me, in YM, one of the things that I really struggled with was when we had the prayer revival. Because it was so new, I'm a very skeptical person. If you tell me something new, I will question you until I understand. Okay, and when the prayer revival happened, I was very, very uncomfortable because I didn't know what was happening. I was very confused, you know, and the worst thing was I had to go and lead prayer. I had to lead prayer for something that I wasn't even sure what was happening. But I spoke to Pastor Rachel and she encouraged me to be open. So I said, fine, I will be open. I'll still do it anyway. And so with that, I, as I brought myself there. You know, week after week, prayer after prayer, I made sure I showed up, even if I didn't understand what was happening. I realized God began to touch my heart. And I began to experience God in ways that I've never experienced before. You know, I began to see visions that I've never seen before. I began to hear words that I've never heard before. And I think many of you who, who caught on to that can also relate to that. So how are you living by the Spirit? Is it just in the spiritual parts of your life? Or is it in every area of your life? My second point is catching the momentum of the Holy Spirit is to die to ourselves and to our fleshly desires. Okay? Nobody likes to give up things. Nobody likes to die to ourselves. But I want to challenge us that a lot of times, a lot of things that are happening is not so much of how we feel about it. Our emotions are the least reliable thing that we can rely on when it comes to the move of God. Our emotions are something we really cannot depend on. If you talk about faith, right, faith doesn't make sense. If you try to make sense out of it, you probably overthink it and then you just step out of it because it doesn't make sense to you. But 
when it comes to catching the momentum of the Spirit, I think one thing that we all really need to do is to adjust ourselves according to what the Spirit is doing and not so much of according to how we feel or what is convenient for us. I think if we look to Jesus as our example, with the movement, do what Jesus did, He has a very, very high standard for us. Okay, If you read your Bibles, you find that He has a very high standard for us. But I think a lot of times, even myself included, we, we give ourselves excuses so that we don't have to live up to that standard. We give ourselves excuses so that we can do just what is convenient for us. You know, some of the things, when I talk to people about coming to church or coming for prayer or coming for CG, these are some of the replies that I get. They say, if I'm free, I will go for CG. If I feel like it, I will show up. If I have nothing to do, then maybe I'll come. That's a lot of convenience there, isn't it? You know, you're just living out of whatever is convenient for you. There's no sacrifice. There's nothing there that you have that is worth giving to God there. And I'm not saying that it's easy to die to ourselves. I think all of us struggle with that. The Bible does say, if you look back to Galatians in the passage, the Bible also says that we will struggle a lot when it comes to following God. Simply because it is what we want as humans is the opposite of what the Spirit is leading us to. But I would say this, if you are struggling today, I would say I'm happy for you that you are struggling. Simply because if you are not struggling, it means that you are not choosing to die to, to yourself. The fact that you are struggling with God about something, the fact that you wake up every day and you have that struggle in your life tells me that you are actually dying to yourself in some areas. You have chosen to do that. And I'm very proud of you if you are struggling in your life. It's a bit morbid, but you know what I mean. Okay, and what does it mean to die to yourself? If we pick up from the video just now, I'm not sure if you heard that, Pastor Adrian, one of Pastor Adrian's message was, dying to yourself is to drop your own banner, drop the things that are important to you in your life, and to take up God's banner, which is the vision that He has for us. And I'm not sure what it might look like for some of us today. Okay? It could be some of your dreams, your own dreams, that are getting in the way of what God wants to do. Okay, I've shared this before and I'll just say it very briefly. For me, one of the things that I needed to let go, okay, was to go overseas. Alright, but little did I know that that decision at that point of time, for me, when I said, okay, I will stay, I didn't know, I didn't realize the extent of my decision. It wasn't just that one point in time where I told God, yes, okay, I will let go of what I want and I will do what you want. It turned out to be a whole process of eight months where I struggled and struggled and struggled with God for eight months before I finally came to a place where I fully let go of that dream. And it was the first time, I remember, I was standing in, in the service, it was still YC at that time, and I was standing in the service, the service wasn't, even hap wasn't very happening, I was just standing there, and for the first time after eight months, you know, I felt a certain joy in my heart as for choosing to stay in Malaysia, for giving up my dream to go overseas. I'm not saying that that's everybody's uh, cross to bear. I'm not saying that's something for everybody to give up. But what, are you give, what do you need to give up in your life? Your own dream that is standing in the way of what God wants to do in your life. The second thing I really needed to give up was my pride. Like I said just now, I'm a very skeptical person. And the person that I'm most skeptical towards is Anand, Pastor Anand. Anything that he says to me, I will question. Any direction or instruction that he gives to me, I will question. To the point that when he gives a new instruction, if I don't have a question, he will come up to me and ask, yes, what you want? Tell me now. That's our relationship at that time. Okay, and it was something that I needed to let go. To come under this leadership, it was something that I needed to let go. It was my pride of always thinking that I'm right. And I came to a point and, and God had to break that a lot in me. Because I always thought I was right. And I always thought that I knew better. I always thought that Pastor Anand doesn't know what he's doing. You know, but God had to teach me 
that there was a bigger picture to this. And the bigger picture was that we move forward. And so he brought me to a place to understand that even if I wasn't right, it doesn't matter. Even if he was wrong and I felt I was, to, and I turned out to be right, it also doesn't matter. It's not something that I needed to prove or defend myself. Because ultimately, what is the bigger picture? Is that we move forward to what God wants us to do. And there was something I needed to die to myself too. Okay? I'm not sure for all of you what you need to die to yourself to today. What desires or what things in your life you need to let go today. For some of our leaders here, it has been letting go of a job that paid them very well. To take on a job that paid them less so that they have more time to, to give to God. For some of our leaders, it was letting go of a job they really wanted, but it was taking up too much time. Okay, and this job gave them extra money, but they let it go anyway because they knew what they were called to. The encouragement for us when we let go of something is this, is that God will never, God is no man's debtor. He will never owe you anything. If you can say to the person next to you, God will never owe you anything. Look into their eyes, please. They need to hear this. God will never, ever owe you anything. When you give up something for God, He gives you back more. And He gives you back in ways that you can never imagine. And I have seen that personally in my family. I have seen that in terms of finances. He may not give back to you the same way that you have given to Him. But He will always give back to you. So what are the things you need to die to today? Okay, let's do a little reflection here. Do you need to spend more time doing your devotions so that you will know what is God's will for your life? Do you need to treat your parents and your siblings better, even if they don't treat you well? Do you need to give up certain friendships or relationships that you know are not good for you or you're not supposed to have now so that you can receive what God has for you and that will always be the best? Do you need to give up certain habits that you have been doing in your life that is holding you back from receiving anything else? Do you need to give up your pride, like me, so that even if somebody else is correct, and you, even if somebody else is wrong and you are correct, that you can still say, it's okay, I don't need to defend myself. Do you need to give up some of your me time so that you can sow into somebody else's life and watch that person grow to the place that you are at today. My challenge for us is in order to catch the momentum of the Spirit, we need to die to ourselves and to our fleshly desires. And the last thing I want to look at is catching the momentum of the Spirit is to continue bearing fruit. Only those who continue to bear fruit are the ones in the Spirit. And they are the ones who will catch the momentum of the Spirit and move forward to where we need to be. I want us to do a little self-reflection. Okay, this is not something new to us, but I think it's always good to see where we are. How dependent are we on the Holy Spirit? If I can get the... Yeah, okay, we'll go one by one. Very quickly, let's just go through the fruit of the Spirit. And I want you to see where you are in your life, okay? Is it there? Yeah. Okay, love. Are you showing sacrificial, undeserved love to help people around you? And usually, it's easier to help your friends. It's very difficult to help your family. Are you showing the same to your family? Okay, do you have joy? Do you sh produce a certain joy in your life where you are not, a joy that is not dependent on your circumstances? Right? But something that is found way deeper, that no matter what happens in your life, you still have that certain joy. Do you have peace in your life? Do you have patience in your life? Okay, let's do this a bit more actively. Something called active learning. Okay, can you look at the person next to you? Ask them, do you have love in your life? And not the feeling kind of love, okay? But the action, the real sacrificial kind of love in your life. Do you have, okay, ask the same person, do you have joy in your life? Okay, do you have peace in your life where despite what is going on in your life, you are still assured that God is with you? 
Do you have patience in your life? Okay, you are allowed to do this. You can hit the person next to you 10 times and then ask them this question. Do you have patience in your life, friend? Do you have kindness in your life? Okay, do you have goodness in your life? Are you faithful in whatever that you have committed to do? Or are you looking for the next happening thing? And the moment something new and happening comes, you are off to that place. Okay, are you gentle? And do you have self-control? There are other areas where we look at when it comes to bearing fruit. When, we, when people see us in their life, eh, sorry, when people see our lives, do they know that we follow Jesus? When people see our lives, do they know who we believe in and what we stand for? Or like Pastor Anand said two weeks ago, do they get confused by our identity? We say one thing, we believe in one thing, but we do something different. You know, um, I think one of the, one of the things that is always very difficult for us is in terms of our actions, I think. That is very subtle. It's not like a very bad thing, okay? And it can even borderline be like, oh, I'm caring for somebody. But when we gossip, I'm not sure how many of us actually do that. You know, my students in my class, today they are the heroes of my story. My students in my class, they are the ultimate rumor spreaders. Ultimate, ultimate. If you are in my class, Sorry for you. Okay? They're the ultimate rumor spreader. So let's say I'm talking to one student here. Okay? And our conversation is, ends like this. So I tell the person, okay, you don't, need to bring, uh, you don't need to bring that tomorrow. Immediately, somebody from the other side of the class, right, will be like, huh, teacher, we don't have to bring our books tomorrow. Ah. I'm like, and then because the other 28 people heard him, all of them get excited. Teacher, we don't have to bring our books tomorrow. Ah. And then I'm just like, you don't even know what we are talking about. Okay, this is a very simple example, but it always starts there. You know, we always like to gossip. In our actions, no matter how small or subtle they are, we are not killing somebody, okay? Neither are we robbing somebody, all right? But these are the little things that I think we need to look at in our life. Sometimes we become too spiritual. We say, no, I'm not killing anybody, I'm not stealing, I'm doing quite well, all right? But if you look at, you really look at your life, are you really bearing fruit, showing that God is in your life? And are we sharing Jesus to the people around us? Some of our leaders just came back from an evangelistic training. And it's very exciting to hear that, uh, three of them and a few of the church leaders, that they have gone to be equipped to learn how to share the gospel even more. And if we look back at our pastor, all right, he's going for a mission trip to Sarawak, which he... Because of his high-class life, he struggles. He's very high-class. When he goes to Peace Haven, he packs his house with him. All right? So that's why, yeah. So that's why he drives on his own. He doesn't follow the bus. But for the sake of the gospel, what are we willing to do? Are we catching on to that momentum, even if it costs us something? And I want to conclude here. I think that will stress the band out because they're not out yet, but it's okay. All right, and I want to conclude here, and just to recap my three points, it's nothing new, but when we talk about catching the momentum of the Holy Spirit, it's not something that we catch at one point on a spiritual high, and then every other part of our life just doesn't matter. You know, as long as we say that we will do it, but every other part of our life is just not doing well. Are we at us to stand? Because I can look, tell that we are sleepy and distracted, but it's okay. Even our standing up is sleepy. I want us to just think back about the three points that I mentioned today. I want us all to close our eyes. I think that's the best way to be not distracted. We can all close our eyes, even at the back.
A sermon is only worth hearing if you actually put it into action. So if you decide that you're just going to sit here and listen and then you're not going to do anything about it, then it's not going to make much difference in your life. And a lot of times, we only know what to put into action when we actually look back at our lives. The word can always be very simple. But if we never do anything about it in our lives, then no matter how intellectual or how profound the word is, it won't make a difference. So I want us to think about it today. The three points that were mentioned today. The first one, think about it in your own life. Are you relying on the Holy Spirit and walking by the Holy Spirit in every single part of your life? Let's close our eyes. It's not so difficult to close our eyes. Let's not be distracted no matter what the person next to us is doing. Maybe at least take this time in your whole week to really think about your relationship with God. Are you really depending on God in everything that you do? Are there areas in your life that you need to die to yourself? You may be 13, you may be 24, you may be older than that. But this is a continuous journey. Are there areas in your life where you know you need to let go? Let's listen to the Holy Spirit speak to us today. You may be a leader, you may be a member, it doesn't matter. And are there areas in our life where we need to make sure or we need to check again because those areas in our life or our life is not bearing fruit. The response today is very simple. It's just for those of us who want, who feel convicted that there are certain things in your life that you need to give up. That is not of God and you know it. You are old enough. You are at least 13. You can hear the Holy Spirit for yourself. Are there things in your life that you know you need to give up? Not just for the sake of giving it up, but so that you can catch on to what God is doing. If there are certain things that weigh you down, sometimes that makes it difficult to catch on to what God is doing. 